Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this bridge talk number 29 since we started in 2016, but the very first bridge talk for this year. My name is Jonas Klevhog, and I work for the bridge as a business developer and uh, collaboration uh, facilitator. Uh, the bridge, as many of you already know, exists to connect science on, and technology on one hand and business and societal development on the other hand, to push humanity forward towards the sustainable development goals. Um, we do that by facilitating team plays between stakeholders that share a specific uh, sustainability challenge. We, we currently have 13 such ongoing collaborations looking for partners everywhere or for funding for that matter. And, um, and uh, you're more than welcome to check out, out our homepage, thebridge.se, to, to, uh, to uh, contact us for collaboration. We also do this Connect Science with Business by spreading knowledge at events like this, the Bridge Talk, the Bridge Summits, uh, the Bridge Interviews, and, and events like these. And this would not be possible without the faithful support of our uh, fantastic partners. The last Bridge Talks have, for obvious reasons, been held with a digital audience, uh, both live and on demand afterwards, of course. So we're happy to explore that and have seen tremendous interest in, in, the, in the on demand versions, actually. Uh, and to our exclusive crowd who's following us live this uh, brisk but very beautiful morning, um, I would like to stress that you are actually uh, the chosen ones to, to, uh, uh, to add the questions and to make this uh, talk and interview uh, as relevant as possible as we go. You're the ones. Please put, post your questions as we go in uh, below the stream and we'll bring them up as we as we uh, continue this chat. And today, um, even our guest is joining us digitally, uh, Andreas Foller, Head of Sustainability at Scania Worldwide. Welcome to the Bridge Talk. Thank you, Jonas. I Good would, uh, you're joining us from Stockholm this morning. Are, are you also experiencing uh, this? Uh, I, I heard on the news actually that it was the coldest morning or actually the highest electricity use or uh, effect uh, used uh, in a long time in Sweden, this morning, this very morning. Um, does the weather in Stockholm imply that too? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a beautiful freezed morning. It's like a painting outside with uh, 20 centimeters of snow. The sun is coming up. So it's, it's beautiful. Fantastic. Yes, and, and my background is actually live. Uh, it's very, it's it's outside the window here in Malmö, in the Malmö Harbour. Uh, brisk morning, beautiful uh, day, but very, very cold. Not as much snow, obviously. Um, I'd, I'd like to just uh, start by asking you, um, Andreas, you're, uh, you're head of sustainability for Scania, one of the main, um, uh, main uh, heavy vehicles brands in the world. Certainly, uh, the uh, the main in Sweden, or uh, at least in in Scania, I would say uh, it's the main brand. Mm. Um, but uh, the pandemic over the last year has chosen industries to uh, to sort of sort of promote or to to pressure. Uh, and it's, uh, in the event and uh, and um, uh, tourism industries uh, have been very hard hit. Uh, it's difficult, though, to, to anticipate sometimes uh, from the outside of an industry uh, how an industry has been hit. So I'd, I'd like to ask, has the, has the pandemic uh, hit the heavy vehicle uh, industry hard or has it helped you, uh, promoted you? What, what's the situation? Well, it's been an extremely challenging year. Uh, already in, in January, uh, 2020, we started to 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 sense and experience uh, disturbances in our global supply chains, starting in China. Uh, we 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 coped with that. Uh, we carried on. Uh, then we started to 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 experience 
harsher and harsher disturbances, which is which is really the nightmare for a manufacturing company when when components don't arrive in in time and 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 when 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 one domino uh, brick falls, uh, it tends to 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 falls uh, quickly. When when it really hit Europe and and northern Italy, uh, we, we we know we were in in big trouble as we have a, a lot of uh, suppliers there. Uh, when 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 France, I think it was in March, uh, closed down. Uh, we also chose to to close down. We 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 understood that there is that's the only reasonable thing we could do. Hmm. Uh, so we. The... we yeah, so that's sorry. on the production side, and and that's yeah. understandable. On mm -hmm. the on the sales and marketing side, uh, yeah. how has the the, the economy or the, the industry uh, prevailed there? Yeah, for a couple of months there, there were no market. Uh, everything stopped. Uh, so so a, a, a supply and, and and production crisis turned in very quickly into a to a to a crisis uh, in in sales. Uh, and then things started to to get slowly into normal. We coped with the with with the, with the disturbances, and, and and we crept back. And then the second wave came in Europe, and and we 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 experienced disturbances again. And it's just it's just so much uncertainties, which which mm -hmm. which our customers experience. They they don't put in the orders, and 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 then the supply chain disturbances. Uh, so, so it's been a really challenging year. We're now experience that that we're coming back. Actually, we're coming back uh, um, more positively than we ever thought. So, so demand is up again. Uh, it's just uh, right now the challenge is to keep up with the demand. So, so the economies are coming back. Uh, we still experience a lot of challenges in our in our supply chain and production systems. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, on, on the domestic side, uh, or we've heard that, that uh, internet sales have gone up and thereby also transportation. So your customers obviously have seen a, 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 an uprise, I'm, I'm sure, and that would uh, indirectly also affect you, but perhaps with a, with a, a delay then. So um, for the last six years, you have been managing sustainability at one of the world's most uh, renowned heavy vehicle manufacturers, certainly mm. the most renowned in Skorna, as as indicated before. Um, I'm curious, what what does a sustainability manager at a heavy vehicle manufacturer do? What's what's the job description? Well, me and uh, I should say that I have a team, so I'm I'm not I'm not alone. But but me and my team, we are responsible for defining and driving and accelerating and coordinating the global sustainability uh, focus areas and priorities across Scania. Uh, very much, it's about uh, understanding the agenda, uh, which is of course externally driven in many ways and then translate that to the to the relevant parts in the company uh, so all the way from uh, purchasing to production to uh, research and development sales and marketing they all have roles to play in our sustainability journey but how can we support them to really take ownership and drive the change needed so uh, we're very much a support function. I mean, Scania is a company that is, uh, has delegated responsibility very much. Uh, the work is being done in the organization. We're not doing sustainability. We're supporting other parts of, of uh, the company to, to, uh, to do it. Do you have manufacturing in, in more than 100 countries or you're established in more than 100 countries and with, with assembly and, and uh, manufacturing. That must be uh, uh, quite a heavy task to coordinate and support an organization delegated to across the world. Um, what, well, what are the different challenges there? Well, I would say, first of all, uh, when you're working in a well-structured company, that, 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 how should I put it? that just works like a, like a machine uh, with values and principles and methods, 
if you can wire in uh, sustainability, just as we wired in quality in the 80s, if you can just tap that into the normal processes and the normal structures, uh, then you don't have to do so much legwork. Uh, so very much is about just getting this into what is common sense in Scania and what is already working. So if for Scania, for instance, we, we have clear, a clear production system, and then uh, when we know that we need now to embark on an, an accelerated sustainability journey, we add uh, a couple of tools to the toolbox and then it works. So I don't, we don't have to be everywhere. We can work with improvements here and there to, to really get things going. But if I, if I may, Jonas, elaborate a little bit on that, because I think it's, it's an important point. Uh, for me, sustainability is, is double the way you approach it. I mean, it's both very much a transformational uh, journey that we need to do, very much because we don't have time, because many of the sustainability challenges that we are facing are so urgent, and we just need to take care of them now. That's where the transformational part comes in. That's why we have put it into our purpose, into our strategy, into our corporate targets. On the other hand, sustainability is, is very practical. It's a toolbox, it's methods. It's something that you can work with every day. It's not a mystical, mythified, strange and difficult thing, it's just, a lot of it is common sense. You put, you, you add it to your toolbox, a few more tools, and then you are on a good path. So it's this double thing that sustainability is that we need to acknowledge. So the big, the big effects, but also the very practical uh, everyday uh, details combined. And, yes. um, and uh, obviously we're pressed for time. Yes, I, we will spend a bit of time on, on the transformational um, ambitions of Scania. And that's actually one of the reasons that we, we asked uh, to have you on as a Bridge uh, Talk uh, guest. Uh, Scania has recently taken a, a, a strong position in, or ambitious position uh, mm -hmm. in its uh, sustainability work. So we'll get to that uh, yep. in a bit. Uh, just for those of, uh, of the viewers who are um, uh, keen to, to become head of sustainability at a heavy vehicles manufacturer uh, sometime in their career, how do you plan your career to get that job? It, it, I, it, I, it hasn't been a lot of planning in my career, I can, I can safely say. I, I studied uh, social science in the 90s, even before I started uh, in, in university, I was passionately interested in, in, in global issues uh, around uh, globalization and justice and resources and, and conflicts. And, and then I studied all that on the university. I became increasingly aware of the pressing challenges uh, that we're facing. And then uh, early on in my career, I got the opportunity to work with business. And I realized uh, both intellectually and practically that, that business has such a role untapped potential here. Uh, and since then, for 20 years now, I've been working with sustainability, global challenges, solutions within the business community. And you can work with sustainability in all sectors, in all jobs, but not everyone can become the head of sustainability in a company. So, so I think it's, it's important to understand that, that uh, sustainability you can work with anywhere. As a software development, you can work with sustainability as an engineer, as a purchaser, or as a salesperson. It's just, just do it. Uh, head of sustainability, I, I, I don't know how to become one. It's been a, it's been a, a rocky, rocky ride. Uh, so you say basically that it's more of a, a social and global uh, interest or a, a human interest rather than a technical uh, background needed in a even in a in a technical company that like like Scania it's it's uh, uh, more beneficiary to have a, a, an interest or a, a social knowledge. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think I think for for a company like Scania, I mean, it would have been great to be an engineer. I think sometimes, I mean, to just really, really do it. But I think the engineers that I'm working with, you have to ask them. But sometimes they, I think they they kind of like that I'm, I'm not one. Mm -hmm. They they need to talk slowly with me. They need to explain things, and it's good for them as well. And together we make it. Uh, we make it comprehensible to, to the outside world and to other groups. Also, of course, if you have an economic background, if you're into uh, finance or, 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 or business or management, that's also a, a plus, I think, for anyone working with change in an organization. Uh, I have neither. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think all many different kinds of educations or, or, or educational backgrounds has their pros and cons. Being a social uh, studying society and, 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 uh, is, is probably very, very rare uh, in my position. But uh, as it uh, sort of, uh, if you read between the lines, a passion to make a difference uh, is also uh, working at, uh, getting you a long way. Um, as we all know, we, we, we have a Paris Agreement since 2015. It's been five years. Um, and recent reports have, have sort of indicated that we're not on par with reaching the 1.5 degree targets or we, we're struggling to, to get there or some, some people may be quite pessimistic about it. Mm. Um, there's lots of work to be done. And Scania uh, is part of an industry that, or transportations of goods and people are usually uh, said to represent some 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Uh, Scania has set some ambitious and, and science-based targets to, to address this. Could you just, um, that, that hmm. very often turns into difficult language. Could you translate that ambition with the science-based targets? Um, hmm. Could you explain yes. that to us so that we uh, understand a bit better? I could. But just to, yeah, I, I will, but can I just comment on, on the first part of your question? Yes, it's been five years since uh, the Paris Agreement. It's been 25, 30 years since uh, we really understood that the climate crisis were real, uh, caused by humans, and uh, has uh, the potential to damage uh, our, our natural world uh, irreversibly. So there's been many, many years of too slow and too little action. The Paris Agreement was a fantastic uh, achievement uh, by the global community. And we now have a pathway uh, towards 2050 uh, where, we, where we need to be decarbonized. We need to be 100% fossil free in the global economy. So uh, for, for Scania, being a company filled with, with engineers and, and, and really uh, counting on science, uh, it was natural for us to align our ambitions uh, with the, what climate scientists says is needed for us, uh, not to risk irreversible damage to our planet. Uh, so we contacted uh, an initiative with some of the world's uh, most renowned environmental organization called the Science-Based Target Initiative. And together with them, we developed uh, carbon reduction targets in line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, it's actually two targets. One target uh, is about the emissions that we very much control ourselves. So when we are burning fossil fuels in our production, in our ovens, for instance, or using service vehicles and uh, that runs on, for instance, diesel, that's called our scope one emissions. And our scope two emissions, which we also control very much ourselves when we're purchasing energy or heating or cooling, emissions are generated by our suppliers, but we control it because we make the contracts with them. Category of emissions that we control ourselves, we will cut in half between 2015 and 2025. So we are very, very aggressively now reducing those emissions. Uh, and if we're doing that, 
science-based target says that we are on a 1.5 degree trajectory. So that's the most ambitious climate reduction target you can have. I would say that those are the easy ones because we control them ourselves. They might cost us, uh, but most of all, we just need to get those emissions down towards zero very quickly. I think that's hygiene. I think all companies should do that. Those who don't do it, uh, I, I, I don't have so much respect for it. Just do it. Then we have the scope three emissions. And, and I don't want to be too technical. So, so I, I could say that those emissions are all other emissions that, that we are indirectly uh, causing through our upstream activities, our supply chain, our logistics, when uh, components are coming to us. It's not our emissions directly, it's our suppliers emissions. And downstream, when our products are being used. And actually only that category is called scope three category 11 in technical language, the use of products makes up 96% of Scania's total emissions. That's where the big chunk of emissions are. That's our responsibility. That's the task of our generation. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about driving the shift to a sustainable transport system. We need to get them down as well. And that is our customers' emissions. So what can we do? Well, we have said that we will cut these emissions by 20%, 2015 to 2025. It doesn't sound as ambitious as the 50% target on scope one and two, but they're much harder because we can just partly influence them. Mm. We can create more uh, efficient powertrains. We can sell more zero emission uh, vehicles, of course. We're going to talk a lot about electrification and batteries and hydrogen in a while uh, but uh, I'm sure that by 2025 we will have come down a lot and then between 2025 and 2035 that's where we will see the big uh, reductions that's where we will really take part and we've done the analysis all the way to 2040 2050 and we know we can do it. We know we can decarbonize even this hard to abate sector. Um, it's just taking it one step at a time and then really integrate it into our business and techno technological plans. I, I really, uh, I'm really inspired by the way that you put it, not just in simple terms, uh, mm -hmm. and, and cutting in half and, and reducing by 20%. But the fact that these targets are actually science-based and then uh, science scientifically in line with the Paris Agreement, so that you're actually um, referring to uh, an agreed baseline, uh, thereby, yeah. so, so to speak, tying the, the story together, <clears throat> that I think is very inspiring. You told me when we spoke before this talk that that 3% of, mm -hmm. of the climate um, the footprint mm -hmm. that you are responsible for is uh, is what happens when the heavy vehicles are produced. 97% uh, mm. of the climate footprint happens on the customer, mm. downstream basically, mm. when the customers mm. use your product, especially if your trucks run on diesel. Um, so so how when you when you talk about the scope one emissions, cutting them in half, that's really the 3% then, or is it... Yeah. Uh, right. And the mo mo more difficult ones, the, the ones that really, really matter are the scope three uh, targets for the customers and cutting them in 20% really means so much more for the, for the planet. Is that a yeah. correct uh, conclusion? Yeah. Okay. It is. And, and I would, I would uh, also claim uh, that it's more, in, in, uh, more, more important for our business. That's what we do. That's our customers. That's our big journey. So, so uh, those. I mean, the focus is there. Obviously, yeah. That's that's correct. So, and and as recently as in November uh, last year, you announced uh, an ambitious um, 
uh, an ambition <laughs> or a target or uh, an effort uh, and launched an effort to become a leader in electrifying the heavy vehicles fleet of the world uh, by uh, investing heavily into batteries and uh, battery technology and electrification. Um, what, what could you tell us about this effort, just in, in so that we we hear it from you? It's better to hear it from you, and uh, rather than uh, sum, summarizing press releases. <laughs> what is this all about? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to sound like a press release. <laughs> yeah. Where should I start? Uh, if you don't mind, I, I, I like to go back uh, a little bit because I, I, I did work in, uh, in the car industry uh, in 2005, 2006 in a Swedish car manufacturer. And then I, I, I took a break from, from the automotive and car industry. I came back 10 years later and actually was a little bit depressed and, uh, because I didn't think a lot had happened uh, in, in the area of climate and emissions. Uh, we, we were still basically talking about the th same things that we were talking about uh, 10 years and cars were still running on petrol and diesel. Uh, there hasn't been any change at all in those. I shouldn't say this because some of my colleagues will be uh, angry with me. But but uh, it's it's not it's not too much to say that that they, uh, those th that decade was a disappointment and, and too little action. Since a couple of years back, so much has happened uh, on the technology side, uh, and and the ambitions in this area has just uh, skyrocketed. So so a couple of years ago, we would have. We, we wouldn't thought that we would have a battery electric truck uh, now for sales so customers can buy it. And even more importantly, it actually makes sense for our customers today uh, in some segments to invest in a battery electric truck. And that's just, that's just, it's just going so fast. And what we have been saying now is that we will from now on launch a, a, an electric model every year so right now we have electric city buses battery electric city buses and we have battery electric uh, distribution trucks in scania world these are the small trucks in your world they're still really big but uh, already in uh, two three years we will have the really big uh, trucks long haul trucks also running on on batteries uh, and electricity so and what's course... the, that, that sounds like the, the uh, really transformational step, as mm -hmm. you referred to before. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, battery electric uh, is one way to run electric fired vehicles. And you talk, mm -hmm. you mentioned hydrogen would be mm -hmm. another. Uh, the fuel cell technology is is quickly evolving as well. Mm -hmm. So so fueling up with hydrogen rather than charging through mm -hmm. charging stations. And that obviously changes again how how vehicles can can operate. Um, what what do you see as the main um, challenges or, or bottlenecks for scaling this or for making this transformational shift happen? It's the energy supply. It's it's the charging infrastructure. Uh, and uh, that that needs to to be in place. Sometimes this is described as a chicken or egg problem. Why should we invest in charging infrastructure when there are no uh, trucks or buses that that needs to be charged uh, mm. and so on? But for me, that's that's nonsense. We need to invest here and now in the charging infrastructure because we and and. I might say also the other uh, competitors, we're there. The technology is here. Uh, we are working on it. It's in our plans, it's in our technical roadmaps. Uh, we are very transparent with when we will have the products in place. But they will not uh, be on the ground if our customers can't use them. And they can't use them if they can't charge them. And that's something we need to do together uh, with politics and industry now coming together as fast as possible and build up this super charger infrastructure and also ensure that there is uh, capacity in the electric grid. Because we're talking about a lot of effect here. 
we're talking yeah. uh, we're not talking uh, electric cars here we're talking electric trucks hauling 40 tons for for four to five hours before they need to recharge wow. uh, and it's, it's it has to be quick because we're competing with diesel that what takes you know 20 minutes to fill up a truck so uh we need to compete with a system that is pretty good pretty well you know developed and and we need to start now so that's that's i would say that then if you allow me to elaborate a bit more of course the batteries are uh, a, a great challenge but mm. we have a lot of confidence we've seen uh technologic development with the costs coming down the capacity going up that is that is uh, like doubling or, or or decreasing by half every year almost so so the business case for a battery electric truck is getting uh, more and more attractive and so, uh, yeah sorry uh, i could yes, talk so forever about this <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I i i realize that and i uh, i appreciate that um so uh, as you said, uh, lots of things have happened a lot over the last years, and uh, to the public, I suppose, the Tesla has been a, a, a seen as a catalyzer for for electric vehicles actually being possible. Um, and and then we've obviously seen the rest of the automotive industry follow. But 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 most people in the automotive industry would probably say that you've been on it for for as long. And the Tesla, sure, they they did. They did uh, tip the scale, but but uh, the work was being done before. Now you have, and, and Tesla uh, made it uh, actually a couple of years ago, probably five years ago, they announced that they would build a gigafactory for batteries, that, that prices of batteries needed to come down. So we could understand that, okay, there's a there's a, an infrastructure needed there. Peter Carlson, the Swedish uh, head of supply chain at Tesla at the time, uh, it has now... Uh, been the, the front runner in, in Sweden and Europe to build uh, the same structure in, in the Nordics, actually. So Northvolt has been uh, uh, leading the, uh, this development and, uh, and announced that they are building, uh, uh, if not gigafactories, large battery factories in, in northern Sweden and in, in uh, mid, uh, close to Södertälje, I suppose. Um, you... You have announced that you will be investing a hundred million or more than a hundred million euros into yeah. battery manufacturing and assembly. That sounds like a, a, a bold project and a, a strong story to to boast about. Please boast about it and, and we'll <laughs> know what, what it's about. Thank you for allowing me to boast. No, uh, okay. I mean we are heavily invested in in Northwold. They will be our primary supplier of battery cells from with uh, from from their uh, factory in in, in Skellefteå. and we're really really proud uh, about that cooperation they have an ambition to to lead the world into green battery technology we have the ambition to lead uh, heavy transport towards sustainability it's a perfect fit okay. they are making the cells but the, that's just the first step uh, the cells then has to become modules where we put a little bit of intelligence into them uh, so we can follow them and make uh, gather the information from them and make them work. Those then has to make into packs uh, of many, many modules. And mm -hmm. then we should have them on, on our chassis, on our, on our vehicles. So there is a lot of things to be done after we receive the North Wall cells from Skellefteå. Uh, that's why we, we now invest in, 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 in the subsequent uh, steps. And, and uh, I think it's uh, 18,000 square meters. It will be a fantastic new building in Södertälje, just 500 meters from my office uh, with state-of-the-art technology. So we really can uh, make sure that uh, we have the same flow uh, into the to 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 the production of these uh, vehicles. We uh, our aspirations to... is sorry. sorry. No, no, just uh, we, saying that yeah. my our aspiration is that already by 2025, 10 percent of our volumes will be electrified. We'll will will have these batteries and have an electric drivetrain, and in 2030, maybe 50 percent of our volumes will be uh, electrified. So, so I mean, we need to industrialize now. These are no pilots or, or prototypes. This is, this is serial production and, and big volumes 
faster than you think. So, so would would all heavy vehicle manufacturers uh, need to get their own assembly uh, plants to utilize uh, the battery technology, or could you even your your effort here uh, be used by or to to supply other vehicle manufacturers or other battery uh, users uh, in in the e transport system? That's an interesting thought. Uh, I'm not the right person to ask, but uh, if anyone is interested in, in, in battery packs, I mean, they, they could give us a call and we can discuss it. Uh, we are working very closely together with uh, the German uh, uh, truck brand uh, MAN, uh, that is a part of the Volkswagen group, just as us. Uh, so, so uh, we we we're, we're we're of course trying to find synergies there. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so let's stick with battery technology for a while. Uh, we've all heard that batteries, um, well, that that battery electric vehicles with batteries are uh, have a higher climate footprint when they're manufactured mm. uh, than the average fossil fuel combustion. Uh, mm -hmm. driven combustion engine driven mm -hmm. uh, vehicle mm -hmm. you mentioned or we talked about the three percent versus 97 percent how does that change that ratio uh, mm -hmm. if you, if you produce a, a vehicle with batteries uh, mm -hmm. does it change at all or, or what what happens it's a good question Jonas because it's all in the numbers right mm -hmm. so when we're moving from uh, uh, internal combustion engine uh, to a battery electric uh, driveline, we are adding uh, maybe 40 tons of CO2 per vehicles. Uh, so, so that is that is really something that we're looking into very much now, and that's also a reason why we chose Northvolt as our battery cell supplier. So we will drive down the emissions from our upstream suppliers. It's not only the batteries, but they are huge. It's two thirds of our carbon footprint in the supply chain will come from our batteries with these products. Uh -huh. But we're also looking at steel, aluminum, and plastics. But that being said, just as you referred to, if you're running a truck on diesel and you're changing that to a battery electric vehicle with the energy electricity mix you have in Europe, you will cut emissions with 50% directly. If that electricity that you charge that battery electric truck with would be then renewable electricity from wind or solar, then you're down to 98% of the diesel uh, equivalent. So just in a couple of months, uh, mm -hmm. you will again have a positive uh, impact compared to the diesel equivalent. So, so it's all in the numbers. The, uh, in the, on the positive side, just a plus. Uh, it's yeah. all in the number. When it comes to decarbonization uh, of the transport sector, this is really a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. But of course, when it comes to other sustainability challenges in the battery value chain, we need to be really attentive with with those yes. minerals and and and, and right. metals sourced that's from. That's the other question I would mm -hmm. really like to to, uh, to to have you comment on. Because the, the other public knowledge about batteries is that they use or we use a lot of uh, rare earth metals in, in batteries, which comes with uh, planet footprints and social footprints and, and um, or social injustice even. Um, so the, there's, there's a strong uh, reason for exploring new raw materials with the batteries. To what extent does Scania in this, with this effort contribute or, or, or participate in research to, to replace these earth metals mm -hmm. in batteries? Uh, well, it, we have three main strategies to address uh, these challenges. One is through our purchasing practices. We are putting strong demand of transparency uh, on our battery cell suppliers that they can show uh, where they are sourcing these uh, minerals and metals and also making sure that there are no 
uh, risks uh, or that they can manage the risks in this. But it is very difficult. I mean, these some of these uh, minerals like cobalt and lithium are sourced often in countries that doesn't really protect the human rights or, or the labor rights of the people. And, and it, it, it's, it's difficult places in the world. So addition to that, we are working on an industry level to make sure that we can work directly with these countries uh, to, to make sure that, that there is, uh, uh, you know, respect of human rights and labor rights in, in these uh, extraction industries. And thirdly, and maybe most importantly, moving forward, uh, and again, coming back to Northwalt and, and their ambitions, we need to uh, minimize the, the extraction of these uh, minerals and metals and mine the system instead. So recycling, taking back uh, these resources, uh, and then using them again, so looping them back to production. So this is what we now are in intense discussion with uh, our suppliers on. How can we, what, what's our part in this? When we are creating the, the, the models and the packs, putting them onto our products, how can we make sure that the battery in the end of life is taken back, the metals and minerals are being recycled, new battery cells can be produced from them. And I think that's, that's uh, what we're striving for. But we need to work on all strategies moving forward because these are real risks mm -hmm. and threats uh, to, the, to the electrification of our industry. And coming from, from the bridge organization, which uh, aims to bridge the gap between science or elementary science uh, actually spawned from, from the European spallation source being built in Lund, soon inaugurated in Lund and also the Max 4 laboratory. Uh, the materials research going on there is actually one of the focus areas is actually batteries, uh, battery technology, batteries that can uh, hold a lot more energy than we know today, battery materials that actually don't rely as much as uh, as today on on uh, uh, minerals. So, in a in a longer term perspective, um, we might come up with uh, we might see some solutions on the material side there as well. Just wanted to point that out. Um, so, um, a quick word then on on hydrogen. Hydrogen. How does yeah. that play a role in in Scania's uh, electrification strategy or work? So hydrogen, of course, uh, is, is a very exciting uh, technology. It's just another energy carrier, basically. Uh, so right now, uh, our major focus is uh, on uh, batteries. Uh, but we're seeing now the, 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 the amount of tension and investments going into hydrogen. We're seeing that that has also a lot of potential. However, we, we are also seeing uh, the challenges. We're seeing that if you're uh, today, there are no uh, big volumes of green hydrogen, and it needs to be green. Other, it doesn't make sense. If you have gray hydrogen produced by fossil uh, electricity or fossil fuels, this, it doesn't make sense uh, for us. So green energy it needs to be produced uh, by uh, electrolysis, and and then you lose like. Uh, a couple of uh, 30%, something like that, in energy. If you take it into a battery, you don't have that waste. And then you put mm -hmm. it on the, on, on, the, on the vehicle and you have to then uh, convert it into, into uh, energy again, electricity to run the, the electric motor, and you lose a lot of energy there as well. So if you compare the two technologies today, we're seeing that battery electric has more potential for the majority of our applications and our customers. In a future where we have an abundance of uh, renewable energy from wind and solar that needs to be stored, then it makes sense to store it in hydrogen. And it also will make sense for some of our customers in some areas where you don't have the, the charging infrastructure, where you have long distances and so on, to go with uh, 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 hydrogen. And, and, and uh, 
So we're not negative. We are trying it. We have pilots going on in both uh, Norway and, and, and Gothenburg with, uh, with uh, fuel cells. But we're also cautious that this technology might come a little bit later. Batteries are here and now. Hydrogen, mm -hmm. um, we believe it's coming a bit later and we need to sort out those challenges that I was talking about. Very interesting. So uh, that brings us close to the end of our uh, morning chat here uh, on Scania's bold ambitions to, to lead the way for electrification of vehicles and also uh, your, uh, your devoted um, uh, commitment to, uh, to the science-based targets that you've set um, based on, on the Paris Agreement. Um, you are leading the way, or your ambition is to lead the way uh, for mm. your industry. But would you say that you also uh, w could uh, lead the way, or actually perhaps be inspired by other industries? That mm. uh, what other industries inspire you in your work when you look at how how the the vehicle industry or the automotive industry could do better? What, where do you um, yeah. find inspiration? We, we find the inspirations from, from, from everywhere. Uh, this uh, transformation that we're talking about needs to go in a mind nubbling speed. And adjacent industries like the energy sector, the battery, the retail, the transport buyers, we all need to work together to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, also like the steel manufacturer and so on, hopefully, with us putting demand on our suppliers and the adjacent industries, and we're sending signals to the energy sector, to the steel sector, and so on, that, that this is where we want to go. You mm -hmm. want to help us out. You need to be as ambitious. And in turn, we are inspired by our customers and our customers' customers that now increasingly putting demand on sustainable fossil-free transports. So. We are constantly being inspired and hopefully inspiring other sectors because we need to work together to do this. I know for a fact that you're inspiring, your efforts are inspiring the aviation industry. Uh, as, as recently as this morning, we heard new figures on the aviation industry and, um, that uh, the, the, the economy uh, is not picking up and they've, they've seen a, uh, an even worse downturn in the last mm. months. Uh, and of course, aiming for electrified aviation or, or uh, flight uh, travel is, uh, is perhaps further in the, in the, in the future than, than for heavy vehicles. But uh, if you lead the way there and, um, and, and uh, lower the price of batteries and uh, increase the capacity of batteries and the infrastructure around it, um, perhaps hydrogen, then, uh, then you would probably also be able to to uh, lead the way for the aviation industry. I hope, at least. Uh, Andreas, I hope so too. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the, the, the ambitions and the plans and, and the scope of Scania this morning with us. Uh, it's mm. been really, really interesting to to learn what you're up to and to, um, to share the hope, actually, with uh, with picking science-based targets and um, and tying them to an ambitious strategy forward so thank you very much for for sharing this uh, this morning with us um, thank you Jonas. thank you for having me uh, as a an ending note i would like to to um, promote our next bridge talk with ulva orquist from plan m who will also talk about mobility but from a more uh, software perspective and how we um, how we go about to bring mobility of the future to our ever-evolving cities. Uh, that will be uh, as a lunch talk and probably uh, at the, uh, in a couple of weeks. It might be on the 18th or the 19th. We'll get back to you on that. Um, and we'll spend that talk uh, eating lunch while we listen to, to Ilva. Uh, and we'll spend the last 15 minutes of that lunch hour uh, discussing the topic with her. And I would also like to uh, promote our 27, uh, April 27 to 29 event, uh, where we all invite you all to participate and to tune in uh, to our 
uh, main spring event for the bridge, uh, which we called hashtag get ready for COP26. When the pandemic postponed the COP26 in November 2022, uh, be held in 2021 instead, uh, we all missed an opportunity to to learn how we're doing with the Paris Agreement in, uh, on a global scale. And uh, we will therefore bring companies, NGOs, uh, policymakers, and the public together to, to, uh, to talk about what is being done, what has happened, how are we doing, and how can we do more to actually get ready for the real COP26 in November, which will be held in Glasgow as planned before, but but a year later. So uh, we invite you all to take part and to, to talk to us about how to be a part of hashtag get ready for COP26. Well, that's all for today. Uh, thank you for watching and have a beautiful rest of the day.